This is the Nobel Podcast, where we talk about how to optimize your technology, life, and mind. We're joined by special operations veterans, entrepreneurs, investors, and others who have overcome difficulty to make it to the top of their craft by staying in the fight. All right, let's start with the easy stuff. What is your name? Rob Huberty, like puberty, but with an H. <laughs> where did you grow up? So my parents are New Yorkers. I was born in Chicago. I lived in Phoenix from the time I was two to 10, and then Connecticut from the time I was 10 to 18. So where did you go to school? So I, I flipped schools all the time. So I, I half Catholic school and then half you know public school. So I would flip back and forth. In high school, I went to a Jesuit high school, and I think that that was a little bit formative. I played football for a lot of my life, and then I wrestled. I was a good football player, but I was undersized. But wrestling, I was pretty good at it. So how did you go from your school, Jesuit, Catholic, to, let's say, either college or the military? And then what was your decision process? Four years ahead of me, my brother I went to the Citadel, and he went in the Army. So... As he was graduating college, I was graduating high school. We used to go to West Point games, like football games. Maybe I'll go to West Point and I'll go try to wrestle for them. So I went through the whole process, like with wrestling. I was like talking to the coaches. You know, I don't know how much interest that I thought they had or whatever it was, but I got my congressional nomination. I didn't apply to any other school. So I got waitlisted. I was called qualified non-select, which is basically a very small candidate pool, which I didn't know at the time. And so I ended up going to college to Arizona. There wasn't a lot of thought into that because I didn't get into West Point and I was bitter about it. Okay. Probably still bitter to this day. So from where you're at right now, which we'll get into, but then hindsight. What was your ultimate goal when you were going into college? Was it, I know you had a, a thing with Atticus Finch, which I never actually asked you about. Was there a goal to be a lawyer there? Was the goal military or was it? Right. So I, I showed up as an engineering major. And so I had like a bunch of math courses and somewhere in the midst of it, I, I don't know what it was, but I was like, you know what? I'd rather be a lawyer. So like my freshman year of college, I went from being engineering to political science. And I said, maybe I'll be a lawyer. Yeah, I grew up, I read To Kill a Mockingbird. If if you go in as a, like an, a lawyer who wants to change law, that's like the opposite of what they're looking for. <laughs> like if you had a law school, they'd be like, dude, I think the system sucks and I want to fix it. They're like, no, 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 no. You are a person who upholds it and don't rock the boat too much. That's like, honestly, that's what the law is. So Atticus Finch gave you an ideal. And when you got right. saw the reality, you realized you needed to pivot. Right. And then my other brother also became a lawyer. So like one is just like Rob. Don't go in the army. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. You won't like what's for dinner. And then my other brother was like, Rob, don't be a lawyer. So, so where did the FDNY fit in there? Was that before, during, or after college? So I started college in 99, and then I ended up graduating in 03. I did a semester in Spain in the fall of 2001. So I got into like some big fight in college, and I, I was like, I was a designated driver. I had a gun pulled on me, and somebody threw a Yankee candle at my head. I never gotten hit harder in my entire life, but it was like one of those big Yankee candles. A guy wound up and threw it as hard as he could, but I didn't see him because like another guy was pushing a girl and it was like in somebody's apartment. And so I was bleeding and I was trying to fight a guy with a gun. It was literally in my face. And I just decided that my friend group maybe was not the best. So I had, I had to like literally drive myself to the hospital because everybody was too drunk to go get stitches. I think I got like... <laughs> 25 stitches in my face or something like that. I was pretty bitter about it and I could have gotten killed. So I did a study abroad instead. So I lived in Spain. I became like a much better student. And so September 11th happened when I was there. Growing up outside of the New York City suburbs, you know, that profoundly affected me. Were you patriotic up to that point or more so after? I don't even know that I am patriotic, mm -hmm. but... I think America's pretty cool. What was it about 9 11 that got you riled up then? I mean, terrorists attacked us. And I think that there is something true for as messed up as the United States is that we are a beacon of hope. I guess, in the, the sense of patriotism, that we are able to solve problems at a profound level with people who are kicked out of their countries, who are ostracized, and we provided a haven for that. It's also how we do our tax code. People can keep more of their money. 
all of those combined to make an unbelievably amazing culture. There's huge flaws, but like, it's pretty cool for that reason. I think all of that stuff's undeniable that America is a beacon of hope. It totally is. So 9-11 happens. You go to ground zero and say, I want to join the FDNY. Yeah. So I think the FDNY is pretty clean. Like everybody likes firefighters, not necessarily police as much. I didn't do it immediately after. So I graduated. So this is like 03. So they basically hired thousands of people and no one retired. Like everybody was so locked in. So no one retired and then they hired some gigantic class. And I, I don't remember how many years they didn't hire for, but it was probably like five plus years. And so I was in like year two of it. And they're like, are they going to hire? And I'm like, no. So I took the civil service exam and I was like, maybe I'll go to law school, do that at night. And then I got hired by the NYPD. And that was another thing where, you know, it, it looked very bureaucratic to me. The hire date was like a year away. So I had to wait to class up for a year. And then I started being like, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. So was that the earliest moment you realized you wanted to be a SEAL? So when I was like a little kid, I was exposed to the SEAL teams through my dad, like his best friend growing up, who at least the, the claim was that he was a frogman. And I was aware of what that was. I read the books about it when I was a kid. And then, you know, I did the pop culture stuff, the dumbest, you know, I would watch Die Hard and think John McClane was like <laughs> a real cop or something like that. You know what I mean? And so, you know, you watch Casey Ryback and Under Siege and be like, Navy SEALs Invincible. You see the Charlie Sheen, you know, Michael Bean movies. And, you know, that gets into your idea of what a Navy SEAL is. And then I read the, you know, the Dick Marcinko books, which are fiction. They're absolutely fiction. And oh, they're, they're not, but they're written as if they were real. And so I read all that stuff. I read the Tom Clancy stuff. And I, I talked to like the first SEAL recruiter who was in 06. I was going to try to go be an officer at the Merchant Marine Academy. He's like, what books have you read? And I named all those off. And he's like, oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> he's just like, you you read the wrong stuff. Anybody who's written a book, not to poke at anybody, but like there is probably a truth gap of like what your perceived truth and what the reality is. And I had an idea that, you know, SEALs were stealth ninja assassins. Too much G.I. Joe, too many Batman comic books, too many Marvel comic books. And I guess I believe them. Like, I'm going to go be a hero. And then, you know, it's not, that's not what it is. So the Marvel, FDNY, NYPD, wrestling, Navy SEAL, where does being a barista fit in there? <laughs> so in the midst of all of that, I needed a job that actually paid money. So I, I interned at the district attorney's office in Philadelphia. And that's, I, didn't know. I got into schools like right out of college, I know, three, but I took a year in between when like I, I took the civil service exam. I reapplied to law schools and I was like, I should see what a lawyer does. So for six months, I was at the district attorney's office in Philly watching like legal cases. And That's awesome. I learned a lot. And I learned that like, I would not like what's for dinner if I was a lawyer. Hmm. And in the midst of it, I had to make money to actually do something. So I, I was a barista at a Starbucks where I actually met my wife. So as I was going in the SEAL teams, I met her. We started dating. And like a moron, I was, you know, I, I told her, I was like, this is not going to work out. This is a short term thing. I'm probably going to go and get killed. I literally said that to her. Um, she's she, melodramatic. Right, she's very, very <laughs> melodramatic. And uh, we've been together for, you know, over 20 years at this point. So good things come from being a barista. When, when did you enlist? What year was it? I signed up in 04, but I, the ship off date wasn't until 05. So I started in 05. You go straight to Buds, you have a rate. So I had, a, I had a rating. So I had to go to OSA school. You, you have to pick like one of a handful of jobs you're used to. And so OS was like intelligence, you know, it was like how, like, I didn't even really care. I was like, whatever gets me to buds. You stare at, you know, radar screens inside like an air conditioned room on a ship where you do, you know, observational stuff on radar, on, you know, the path of the ship and all that stuff. And you're supposed to to help them. And it, it, it looks like what the guys in space balls do. And that's what it is to best describe it. So that was in damn neck going to OSA school. And I, you know, I was trying very hard then and, you know, going in with your college degree and having kind of background. So like I, I went through boot camp and I got like the award for best folding your laundry and ironing your underwear guy. Rock on. So I was one of those guys. 
And then OSA school, like I did, I don't, I don't think I lost a point in the whole thing. So when I graduated, like I was the honor man of my OSA school thing because like I had a college degree and most other people don't. And like, I'm not going to mess this up. And then after that buds. So fast forward to buds, you, you said before that it actually lived up to your expectations. Can you dig into what that meant? What did you expect it to be? And what was it? So I think almost everything that I've ever done and everything I've ever seen that I had an idea of like what a superhero is, it doesn't exist, right? I, I read CIA books and I watched James Bond stuff, and then you realize what a spy does, and it's not that. It's and it, it, it's not. It's so far from that that it like maybe it's so massively disappointing that like you can't even ever come to terms with like you're not going to shoot a gun and then like crack a safe and like you're not going to do any of those things. You're going to pay somebody money and like try to get recruit people. Like it's it's so missold. And I think even being a miss a Navy SEAL, I thought I would be on a secret mission, never to be seen again. And that's I was just gonna do secret missions and that. And like I guess some of the missions are secret, but like it's not really that. It's 99% boring, 1% like exhilarating. But Buds is the closest thing I've ever done in my life of something that lived up to expectation. Like the difficulty in one, you know, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. day is probably not that bad, but but the effect of like six months of basically every day being completely miserable is pretty good. I think log PT and boats on your heads are pretty, pretty awful. And I, I don't know that there's a whole lot of people who could not get scuffed by that. If you put the toughest people in the world under a log in a log PT for the three hours that they last, you're going to scuff them. Like that's no, nobody can make it through that unscathed was there ever a moment you actually considered quitting no i and maybe that's just because i'm stupid and I, I i don't know what it is every moment i wish that we were doing something else so like you're in a log pt is like this is really terrible i wish that we we're getting sort of tortured you know and you get sort of tortured and you're like this is really terrible i wish we were doing the o course you know there are certain things i was better at that like the o course was a little bit of a vacation for me i was not a great soft sand runner so that was torture every time you know like these some, some things were better than others but like one of the most important things about buds is the meaning you get from it the fortifying your soul for whatever comes what was the most meaningful moment of buds if you could remember one i, I don't know that there's a meaningful moment and i don't think the lessons are, are necessarily profound i think the best part of buds is the fact that it's not fair like there's very little of it is fair and, and every now and again like an instructor comes and gets you in the middle of the night and it's not on the program and it's they're going through a divorce and if they were to be found out they'd get in trouble for it and you get destroyed in the middle of the night in the laundry room and you work out for like three hours so you're like sweating through your stuff and you're bleeding in your hands and you're like this isn't fair i'm getting extra buds and the next day you have like a log bt and like if you're somebody who will crumble from that then you're going to be somebody who crumbles. And there's a beauty about doing something that's unfair. I think in our society, it's not fair. And like, buds isn't fair. And they're like, they're going to get rid of me. And we're like, yeah, no, I know. That's kind of the point. And there's a beauty in that of doing stuff that's not fair all the time because war is not fair. Like you have to win. Like you, you can't just like exist. Like you have to get through the whole thing when everything is stacked against you. And they're like, Pfft. We're going to lunge from here until the other base that's three miles away. And you have to lunge with a log all the way there and all the way back, which is like insurmountable. And they're like, no, but we're just going to do it until we're done. You're like, that's, that's impossible. Like, yeah, probably. It makes tough people. So you get through all that, but SQT, you graduate, you tried in, and then you show up to the team as a new guy. Right. Can you talk about what it's like to be inside of the brain as someone who goes from that pinnacle of training to then the bottom, the bottom hierarchy of team? Checking into the team was very bad for me. It was worse being a new guy than it was going through buds. It was even less fair. I checked in while the team was on deployment and they were coming home. So different guys were coming home in different groups and they were doing turnover ops. Clarky Schwedler got killed in a house and they left them in there and Mike Day got shot 27 times in the same, like that, that happened in the, the same op. 
And so a lot of the dudes came back pretty mentally scarred. So they, they left both of those guys dead in the house and they didn't know it. They did a head count. They thought they were up. And then they're like, okay, somebody just dead in the door. And then Mike Day is also in there. And like some kind of combination of that. I wasn't there. I was in Virginia Beach. And so they came home and uh, guys were not okay from that. And so you just had guys take it out on the new guys. And, and some of it was out of like a good place. Like the stakes are so high in the war that we're fighting, you have to be perfect. And then for whatever reason, the platoon that I was in, the chiefs were like, new guys get no schools. Mm -hmm. I chipped paint and repainted hallways at the old SEAL Team 4 building. And then basically like guys would like make you take them out as a designated driver and they would just mess with you. And it was like six months of that. And like that sucked. There wasn't a culture of the platoon that I was going into that were like, hey, we can be friends and teammates or we're to build. And no, there was no, it was awful. It was basically hazing. The first six months were brutal. After that, like it got better, but like, you know, the, the hazing kind of stuff was pretty pronounced. That's interesting from my perspective, because when I checked in, I was your new guy. How did your experience as a new guy influence the way you treated your new guys? So, I mean, it's up to you to decide this, but the worse you get it and the more that I thought it was stupid, the less I wanted to do it. And I was like, we are not even going to like do anything but treat them as like teammates. That that was like what I said. And like, we all came together and talked about it. And then Rob Strasberger actually like brought me in and he's like, you can't do that. Like, that's really dangerous. He's like, I understand your take. And Rob Strasberger was like maybe a guy who enjoyed bringing up new guys, maybe in a harsh manner. So I'm, I'm very familiar with that. So if, if there was a method behind the madness, please enlighten me. So he's like, new guys come in super arrogant because they go through something that is like impossibly difficult and you have to quash them down that just because they went through that, they were the number one shot in their class. Like you're going to see like actual professional shooters. And like, they have to learn and what you can't do is hold them to the same standard as guys who have been there and done that. Like they, they need to have very harsh realities to lessons. And he's like, you can be fair and do that. And then you could be unfair. A lot of the stories that are very bad always involve drinking. And so like, if you can avoid that kind of stuff, I think the fairness is different. I was extremely anti-hazing for you guys. And we can only go after the people who have like have these egos have whatever and aren't willing to listen and there were other guys who were against that and usually the guys who got hazed the worst become the the lead the leading instigator of it i don't know what it is so without naming names the one that lives in your mind the most was probably hazed the most hmm. and then he turned it back like i'm gonna get these guys and i, I had an opposite feeling of that I mean, for my part, there was a clear difference between hazing out of joy and hazing for mentorship. Right. And you were, you were purely a mentor. That was, that was greatly appreciated. So in the teams, what were your specialties? You start off as basically an assaulter. And, and usually when they do that, you carry the heavy gun. So my first deployment, I, I think that they, you know, my team was like, Hey, you're pretty smart. So you're going to do the the SSE stuff. And my first deployment, we did like a JSOC mission set that was like more high end. And we ended up working with FBI, like CIA stuff. And so we had to like tell a story after every ops, you come home from a mission and then have to go debrief the FBI. So I did like the Intel stuff as like an insulter. And then like, you know, the crime scene investigation, like mm -hmm. what were the things that you picked up from here? You know, we call that SSE. It's the, the CSI, the, you get the hard drives, the papers, the documents, you bring them back, you tell them what room, this is where we found the people. And then so that they can basically do a court case in an op. Like I basically was in charge of everything that came off of it. Right. And so that was without any school because I was a new guy. They're like, new guys don't get schools between my first and second deployment. I got to do basically all the cool schools I wanted. So I became a sniper, a breacher and a JTAC in between that second workout. Oh, that's huge. To me, what I was most proud of as being in a SEAL team was being like a team lead, a sniper, and like a point man. I'm, I'm 10 years out of the military, but a lot of the things of how to be a point man, how to be a sniper, 
live with me still because like you you are responsible for every foot step that your team takes you don't want to get people tired you can't walk them over a minefield you can't make mistakes you have to paint this picture memorize everything and then like give the best way in being a point man and being responsible for infill exfill was something that i really prided myself in what was the impetus for you decide to transition out of the teams and out of the navy so it was it was a few things i think the number one thing was the decline of the gwat the operational tempo deploying for purpose we had a great impact on like our effect on my first deployment it wasn't super kinetic but like we ended up putting real bad guys to death a lot the second one was extremely kinetic it was a little bit the wild west the third one was meaningful because we would go into the areas that mattered and it was like a strike force thing how do you hold yourself as a warrior and i don't think that going through a training block for the 15th time doing shaws and being like i'm really great at shaws matters if you don't go to war with it did you want to do a career and realize this halfway through I, I didn't even think about it. I was very willing to do a career. I loved the SEAL teams. I loved the people I worked with. I've, I've never worked with better people. And getting out of the military, I craved it so much that we came and we started this because I feel naked without it. I've never felt a more place of belonging than I did in the SEAL teams, even though I think I'm an anomaly in the SEAL teams. I think that like I was a weird analytical person in the corner but I still felt an unbelievable sense of belonging with the most amazing people. I would have made it a career, but the bureaucracy is so defeating for someone like me. And if there's not a war, I'm someone who has to ask why. And it, it became so debilitating at certain points when I think what we were doing was so unbelievably stupid and, and potentially could cost lives. And I'd be like, why are we doing this? There's so many alternatives. I have better ideas that will work better that can do this if you let me do it. And they're like, you're in the military. And that was disheartening. And like, you'd have admirals come in and be like, well, the new thing is this. And I understand why, but it just turns out that I was probably not good at that. Mm -hmm. And seeing war is the only thing that matters to like my third pump, I literally was training at Shaw's or something like that. And they, they made me leave for like six hours to do a pee test. Mm. And I was incredulous. I was like, you could pee time test me anytime you want. You're making me miss the most important training to me on something that is profoundly stupid. And they shake their shoulders and they're like, it's the military. And you're like, you didn't do this four years ago. You would, you would never have done this four years ago. And they wouldn't have. But in 2014, when I got out, I just I feel like it was the right time. So I had, I had orders to go to green team and like, you know, try my hand at that. And I got into Wharton at the same time. I saw not a whole lot of war in front of me. I was 10 years in and then my wife got pregnant. And so I know that being a family in the military is terrible. I wouldn't like what's for dinner. I would just be doing that and it would be a job. And to me, being a SEAL was not a job. I joke when I say this, but I'm bad at having a boss because even, you know, I, I went to Amazon afterwards and th this, the same kind of questions arose. It was a very similar structure and it's, it's, a, it is an innovative company, but if you're around the wrong leadership, it becomes bureaucratic and they're like, wow, our hands are tied. We can't do that. Our hands are tied. We can't do that. And the number of answers that I get with that, I get so frustrated that I, maybe I'm just bad at having the boss. And I, I think the military, the, the, the impetus for getting out is a family, is the dying of the war, is the increase of bureaucracy, and like my incompatibility with all of those things. If I have a mission and I'm going to put my life on the line for something that I find noble, I would have done it forever. But it's just not the reality of it to me. And, you know, Luckily, we have people who are willing to stand on that line whose tolerance for that is better and maybe they're more patriotic, better. We're fortunate to have those people, but it's just that that can't be me. Let's look at 2014 to 2018, the journey from Warden to Amazon 
founding zero eyes but in the context of the transition out of the seal team because they're all tied together right can you can you weave that story yeah so the you know getting into a nice business school is great and i was really excited and i thought that they were going to teach me something that was somehow unknowable i thought wharton business school and finance knew something that like the world doesn't know and that's why they're so good and it's absolutely not true Everything there can be learned at the University of Phoenix online. I think that my classmates were working 20 hours a week and I was working 60 mm. and I had kids and it was really difficult for me. I went a million miles an hour and I was training to go to green team. And in a very short window, I took like the, the GMAT for 10 hours a day I would study. And that's, I had 30 days and that was basically it. And then I got into school but I, I got in conditionally. If you haven't taken a calculus class since you were like, it's not on your college transcripts, it was on my high school transcripts. So they made me take a calculus and stats course. So in the middle of transition, I had to take like online college courses. And so I did that the same thing, 10 to 12 hours a day, I would take these courses. I finished, you know, three month courses in like 30 days. Hmm. And like the GMAT to this, to that, like it, it was so overwhelming. And then school was overwhelming too. And then I was like, well, what do you want to do? And you're like, I don't even understand the question. What do you like? I don't understand the question. What do you mean? What do I like? Well, what do you want to do? Like, I don't know. And so like a, a lot of business school was that. I thought Amazon was a really innovative company and really cool because there's another SEAL who went to Wharton who's like, hey, this is really bad, but you'll be good at it. And like, I'm going to put you in a building that's innovative and cool cool. Awesome. I'm going to do that. So I did. And I saw this will sound arrogant, but a lack of leadership that I could provide that would have been empowering. And I was like, I could make a massive difference in Amazon by how people are treated and all these things that I've learned because there was a lot of lows, you know, the, the last deployment, you know, our commanding officer killed himself. So the lead up to it, like I was more than just like a fly on the wall. Like I was part of it and I knew what toxic leadership looked like. I knew what good leaders and like in, in profound ways where there's loss of life. And I was like, I could show up to that organization. I can be transformative. And then I learned that they don't care. And, and I learned that most businesses don't care. You have to be good at the job itself for 20 years first, before I think the leadership stuff matters. And that was disheartening. And you're like, I could make everybody better if you listen to me. And they're like, we're not going to listen to you until you know like the, the most minute detail of this. And then maybe we'll promote you. My second year of business school, I ended up working at Amazon and doing that. And I, I had a leader that was what I felt was very similar to the leader who killed himself. And you're like, this is very difficult to fix. And so I try to create a better environment for those who work under me. So like you eat the, the terrible hostile stuff that they give you and then you don't turn around to give it to your people. Like you try to provide a better environment for them. So how, how did co-founding Zero Eyes allow you to channel all, all that transition from the SEAL teams, everything you learned from Amazon, everything from business school and tie it all together? I had such strong opinions on how I thought the world should work and how a business should work and all these lessons that I think I had learned. And I had organizations that were unwilling to accept me as a part of it. It was so disheartening, so depressing and having like a big purpose and then going for a company that just doesn't care the things that you have and doesn't want it. And they're like, just fit our thing or we'll fire you. And then you're like, you're returning everything they want and more and they don't even care. They're like, yeah, you're not doing it our way though. And you're just like, I'm successful in the data. You say that you're data people and I like my data is great. They're like, we don't even care. I don't like your attitude. And you're like, I'm trying to transform things and become more than they don't want it. So I was totally depressed and I, I didn't want to wake up anymore. And then I was friends with you guys and you were, you, we all had similar stories. And then, you know, there was an impetus, you know, Hey, do you want to do this video analytics thing or whatever? And it was one of those things. I want to work with people I care about and I want to solve a problem. And I don't care if it works or not. Like I, I need to put myself and devote myself to something that I care about with people I care about. And so I remember sitting in a car with you really early on and you're like, 
this isn't going to work. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I don't care. Like I, 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 I'm so far down a rabbit hole of something that I, I, I genuinely hate. I felt like a TV that wasn't on a channel that just had fuzz every day of my life. i like, I didn't feel things anymore. I could enjoy the good things. So founding this gave me an opportunity to do something that I cared about. And then really passionately, like the leaders were like, how do I, how do I bring up a team and teach them the things that I think are important and do it in a way that I think with values that I have when, you know, there's a lot of really cool stuff at Amazon that's like based on like Jeff Bezos and then bastardized by a bunch of employees. And when I get to make those same rules that like his rules didn't make sense to me. like some of them were like kind of crazy and I think wrong, but they work for them. So we get to make those own rules in the way that makes sense to us in a manner that I want. It has been like soul affirming. It gives me purpose. I, I couldn't care more about something. My stress, I think, has gone up, but my level of caring and my enjoyment of life are so profoundly different of trying to solve a problem that matters to me and then trying to do it with people that I love and care about. Like, I don't know. I don't know another way to be. You made a comment that like, I still think about on the similarities between how to make the perfect caffeinated beverage, how to smoke the perfect piece of meat and how to run zero eyes and an entrepreneurial VC backed tech company. Can you elaborate on the similarities between those? So everything that I've ever done in, in my life to solve problems, I've A B tested everything. I don't think that the way that you solve a problem in my life has ever been tied to writing a gigantic plan. The only way I've done it is you make incremental changes and you see did it work. And so it, it literally started when I was probably 13 years old and I started like lifting weights and seeing if I do curls on this day, cause I was doing like the Arnold Schwarzenegger, like I'm a pop culture person. And like, I started lifting weights in the way Arnold did. And like, I would watch Rocky and like punch the punching bag, like, like the dumbest stuff, but it, it kind of worked. And you would do training things and you'd, you'd read about, you know, like the boxers on how they would run and how they would do that. And as I got into wrestling, you like, what did Dan Gable do and all these crazy things. And you try to combine it and you try to be like, all right, what works for me? And so you create a workout program and, and somewhere I ended up years later, basically doing CrossFit before CrossFit started because I learned to be a better wrestler. Jack and steel wasn't really as good as being able to like do push-ups and pull-ups and squats for like 20 minutes straight till you threw up in a trash can. Like being able to do back squat, what Arnold could did make you a better wrestler. And so I was like, okay, so AB test that, which one works better? This all, oh, this one works better. And, and when you're 16 years old, almost anything you could do by the time you're 17 is going to have a profound effect. But you would get that data and that feedback loop and you're like, oh my God, this is awesome. What if I start taking creatine? What if I have protein? What if I just eat only apples? And so I've just solved problems in that way the entire time. And when I make coffee, I do the same thing. What if I do 17 grams of water versus one gram of you know, coffee? What if it's 16? What if it's 15? You start doing that. What about 205 for a temperature? What about 212? And you just play with it and play with it and play with it. And then you do a taste test, which one's better. In the SEAL teams, it was the same thing. Like what shoes are the best shoes? What are this? What like you just nerd out about that. And the feedback on a lot of the stuff is so quick that you're able to make determinations whether something is good or not. And when we were like, what do I know about AI? Well, I don't, but I know how to A and B test. And so how do I solve problems? And, you know, I'm, I'm about to be 43 here shortly. I grew up in a generation that I'm either the first year of millennial or like the last year of Gen X. And like, I, both of them don't quite feel right. I've heard it referred to as the Oregon trail generation of that era. I would go to school and on a five and a half floppy disk, a real floppy disk and an Apple II computer as like an educational thing, you'd play Oregon trail. And I, I remember before computers and I know every single generation of like how we solve problems and how we use technology to solve problems. 
And if you A, B test everything in your life, if, if you can do that wholeheartedly and not be afraid to fail, it's unbelievable. So like if you, if you can do basically like three things, accept failure and move on, experiment and communicate well, I think that like you just like you've unlocked the secret of life. We're all bad at all of those at different times. We become bad at experimenting. Accepting failure is always hard, but the beauty of the SEAL teams is when you have the most amazing people next to you and you're fighting for every inch, you're going to fail all the time. If you A, B test and like, how do I compete with these people all the time? It's profound. Pick yourself up from every failure, experiment again and again, and then like communicate well of what you're doing. Like that's it. So going from how to make a perfect cup of coffee to how to make a startup that works, I think it's literally the same. That's how I view it in my mind. And so you have to experiment yourself, which will work for me. And so if you want to start an AI company, it's the same way of barbecue. A little bit is to make bad barbecue first and like come up with something that's embarrassing and then make it good. We're running up on time. So let's do some rapid fire questions. If you could have a conversation with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? I think Yvonne Chouinard is pretty cool of starting Patagonia. If you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be? It would be about zero eyes to spread the word. Three books you think would change everybody's lives. Atticus Finch, To Kill a Mockingbird. Changed the way I saw the world when I was, you know, 12. It, it, it's almost lame to say, but Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. Mm -hmm. The warrior thing like that unlocked something in my soul when I was, you know, 20 years old. I, I don't necessarily know that I'm an advocate for him anymore, but the Malcolm Gladwell books of like Blink, I, I actually don't think they're super scientific, but when I was, you know, 20, 21 years old and you would read those, you're like, there's other ways to view this world. How we make decisions and how we do this isn't that straightforward. And when you start thinking about those things, I think it's very interesting. And three movies you think would change people's lives. I'm a big Lebowski Super fan. I think that the pursuit of the pointless isn't pointless and, you know, fun and goofy and, and nice is pretty cool. I, I think that there's a message in that movie of, you know, the, the, the Tao of the dude or whatever you want to call it, like chill out and kind of enjoy this experience. There's some element of that. I don't know if that's going to change your life, but it did for me. I think that there's some beautiful movies that unlock something in me that when I viewed them had an emotional connection for whatever reason, Marlon Brando and on the waterfront is a movie that like, I can never forget. It's about dock workers. It was about a certain time. It was about unions, a certain time in the United States. It's the one where he says, I could have been a somebody, I could have been a contender. I don't know. That's one that like, I'll always love. And then kind of yearly, I watch one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And there's something about Jack Nicholson and all the people in that. Are they really crazy? And like, how do you pursue your life? There's something about that movie that that's bigger than the movie itself to me. That's it for this episode. If you want to check out more from the podcast, head to zeroeyes.com slash Nobel, where you can see show notes, read more about our guests and suggest guests or topics of your own. Until next time, stay in the fight. Don't ring the bell.